Okay, thank you, brother. Now, if you look at verse number 7 there, Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse number 7, it begins by saying, I have forsaken mine house. The title for the sermon this morning is, I have forsaken mine house. Now, I thought I'd better take that as a title because... You know, God forbid, I would not want God to say that about this house. You know, about Blessed Hope Baptist Church, that God would say about this house, this church, I have forsaken mine house. So these things are, are warnings for us, brethren. You know, we can't just pretend that we're an in, in, you know, invincible church, that nothing, you know, can ever hurt us, and, you know, the Lord may never consider removing His presence from us. These things are written in the Bible so we can meditate on this, see how God removed His presence from His people, and that can happen to us as well. Again, this has nothing to do with our salvation, but this has to do with our fellowship. This has to do with our, fellowship, our, our worship with the Lord God. But let's start there in verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse number 1. The Bible reads, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. So I just want you to notice who's speaking here. Jeremiah is speaking to the Lord God. Now notice what he says. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments, wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper. Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? So Jeremiah starts by saying, Look, Lord, I know you're a righteous God, and I want to talk to you, Lord. I want to, you know, he's, he, he bows down to prayer. He's speaking to the Lord. He says, Look, I really want to talk to you about your judgments, God. Okay? So there's something bothering Jeremiah. And he says, Ask God the question, Why do the wicked prosper, Lord? Why is it that the, the, those that are wicked here on this land, or those that are against you, those that hate your, your, your word, why do they seem to be doing so well in life, Lord? Why do they have the, 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 the big house and, and, and the cars and, and, and the wealth, and they've got the, the prosperity that they've got, they seem to be living their life at the fullest? Lord, they're on Facebook, they're constantly on holidays. Look how happy they seem to be, Lord, but I know they're wicked. So Jeremiah starts asking this question, why is it, Lord, that we see the wicked prosper? And I don't know if this ever crosses your mind. And I, I know for me, as a, as a teenager, this thought crossed my mind. Because as a teenager, as a safe teenager, I'm trying to live for the Lord. I'm trying to live godly. I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying to keep myself pure from, you know, uh, you know alcohol and drugs and, 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 you know, and fornication. And, and I'm looking at other people. I'm looking at other people in the world that don't seem to love God. You know, they're just giving themselves over to sin and nothing seems to be happening to them. In fact, they seem to prosper. In fact, they seem to be getting the high paying jobs and doing so well in life. And you start wondering, well, Lord, I need to talk to you about your judgments, God. Something doesn't seem right to me. And I don't know if that's ever crossed your mind. It's ever been, been a thought. But you see here, Jeremiah is asking that question. And then uh, what does he say in verse number two? He says, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know if I finished verse number one. Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? So those that are doing bad things, they seem to be so happy, Lord. What's going on? Verse number two. Thou hast planted them. Yea, they have taken root. They grow. Yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. They even seem to give you lip service, God. They even seem to praise you. They even seem to, oh, thank you, God, for, for my prosperity and my, and my, 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 my well-doing in life. But they're, they're very far from you, Lord. They're, they're very wicked. How is it, Lord, that they prosper? Well, this isn't a question that only crossed Jeremiah's mind. It's not only a question that crossed me and my mind when I was a teenager. If you can keep your finger there, let's go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. And I just want to show you, in fact, many times in the Psalms, you'll see the same idea being asked. The psalmist asking God, why is it that the wicked seem to prosper? And brethren, if that's crossed your mind, then let's, uh, you know, let's look at Psalm 73. And if you have your own time at home, if this is a, a topic that bothers you, or you, know, you have questions over, let me encourage you to read all of Psalm 73. Because all of Psalm 73 deals with this topic. Okay? But we're just going to look at different, uh, just portions of Psalm 73. <clears throat> Look at verse number 1, Psalm 73, verse number 1. It says, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such are, uh, as are of a clean heart. But then it says this, But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For, so what the psalmist is saying, look, yes, Lord, you know, you know you're, you're good to those that are clean in heart, but you know, I'm slipping away, Lord. You know, the, the psalmist is saying, I'm starting to backslide, Lord. I'm starting to, you know, desire, desire the wilderness and, and sinful things. And, he said, and then in verse number 3, he explains why. He says, For I was envious at the foolish 
when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The psalmist says, look, Lord, I, I, I'm looking at the wicked doing so well. They're prospering. And because I'm seeing that, Lord, I've become envious. I, I want what they want, Lord. I, I want what they have, Lord. Right? I, I want their, their prosperity. I, I, want them, I want to be successful in life the same way the wicked here are being successful in life. And so because he's got that desire, he's got that natural law, they seem to be doing so well. This is why I'm sleeping, Lord. This is why, I, you know, I'm trying to live godly. I'm trying to be clean of heart, but they're doing so well over there, Lord. Why can't I just go that way? Why can't I follow that off that, Lord, right? So the psalmist asks this question. Drop down to verse number 15. It says, if I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children, so he's saying, look, if, if I start telling people in my church, or, you know, my, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, like, you know, wow, the wicked are doing so well, that it's going to offend God's children. Like, like it is an offensive thought to others, okay? So he realizes he's in the wrong. He realizes that by thinking this way and being envious, this, he's in the wrong here. But then he says in verse number 16, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until... So this thought is very painful to the psalmist, right? The wicked are doing so well, Lord. I want to be like that. And then he realized, man, this is too painful for me. When is it, why is it too painful? He says uh, in verse number uh, 17, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. He goes, man, I had these stupid, foolish thoughts. I was envious for these wicked until I came to church. Until I understood, they have an end. What is that end? Look at verse number 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. And so the psalmist says, Ah, oh, you know, I wanted to be like them, Lord. I was so envious until I just, it just dawned on me. I understood. I came to your sanctuary. I came here in your word. And I understand that one day you will judge them, Lord. One day they will be destroyed. One day, one day they're going to be cast down and you're going to tread over them, Lord. Then I understood, oh man, you know, right now you're giving them time. Right now you're being long-suffering. Right now you're being merciful. Right now, Lord, you're giving them an opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ. But there comes a time when they reject Christ over and over again and your judgment is going to fall upon them. And I don't want that judgment to fall upon me. Okay? But he only understood that when he got himself into the sanctuary of the Lord. Okay? And for the New Testament, that would be your local church. And this is why it's so important to preach on the judgment of God. You know, and explain to, to the congregation that God will one day destroy the wicked. Okay? But if you go to church, it's love, love, love. God loves it all. You know, you know, but Lord, the wicked are doing so well. And then, well, maybe I should follow after their ways then, Lord. If you just seem to love everybody, you're never going to pass judgment on anybody. You know, that's all you are, Lord. That, you know, you're not this God of justice. Then why not just walk after the wicked? And many churches have patted themselves after the world. You know, you go into many churches, you feel like you've walked into a club. You know, it's some, some rave party. You know, I, I remember once um, when I was a teenager, my, my church youth group, they went to Hillsong. You know, there was some band playing, some Christian, Christian band, you know, playing that rock music. And, and I thought, man, this is different. I've never seen this in church. And look, it's full of young people, right? And, you know, it's all full, full of... But then it's like you, you talk to some of the guys. Why are they there? Oh, to pick up the girls, to, to check out the girls, you know, check, check. What, what, what in the world? Are we going to church for that? Are we going to church for the music? Are we going to... Are we just... Is this just like a Christian clubbing scene? Is, is that what it is? Because what are they? They've, they've envied the wicked. They said, "Well, look, 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 look how the wicked prosper. Look how they, uh, you know, get huge groups of people together. Let's pattern our church after that." But that way is destruction. Hey, those type of churches—they're going to be destroyed. I mean, so many of those people aren't even saved to begin with, anyway. They've got a false gospel many times, and so they've pursued after the ways of the wicked. Hey, they're leading people to damnation. And you know what? I, I don't know if you ever wonder why is our church small. Why does, it take, why does it seem so, so much effort in order for it to grow? Well, you know what? We're not going to pattern ourselves after the wicked. Don't worry about it. Just, let, let's just do what God wants us to do. Okay? Let's just serve Him faithfully and not be envious of worldliness and, and how they, they apparently seem to prosper because their destruction will come. You're still in Psalm 73. Drop down to verse number 22. Psalm 73, verse number 22. Then he says, So foolish was I. 
He goes, man, I was foolish to think they were going to prosper, right? That they're doing so well. And ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. What is a beast? An animal. He said, man, I'm just a dumb animal. Why did I think that way? Why did I say, oh, man, I'm so envious of them. Oh, man, that was so stupid, right? I'm such a stupid animal, the psalmist says. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Okay, so you can see this is a topic that the psalmist struggled with. This is a topic that Jeremiah struggled with. And you may struggle with this. You know, and, and I, I, like I said, the reason I, I remember just in my teenage years struggling with that is because when you, when you go from being a child to an adult, you know, you start questioning a lot of things. You know, you, you start developing your own thoughts and your hormones are uh, working through your body. And, you, you know, God's using that time to help you uh, develop into a, 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 an adult, you know, someone that can take responsibility for yourselves. And you're going to start having all different kinds of thoughts and ideas. And I tell you, and I'm telling this to my children and anyone else here that might be a teenager or older, and there's going to come a time when you're going to be thinking, why, you know, why am I, why, why are my parents trying to uh, bring me to church and, and learn about God and, and to live a clean and pure life? But when I go and hang out with my mates or if I go to work and I see my colleagues, they're full of wickedness. They seem to enjoy, look how much they enjoy life. Look how happy they seem. Look at all the sins they participate in of. And because you have the flesh, you're going to be like, well, I, I kind of want that, Lord. They seem to be doing so well, okay? But what you need to do is remember that God's judgment is going to fall upon them. It's not like that forever. You know, our life is a vapor. It's, it's here one moment, it's gone the next. Yeah. And if they don't believe on Jesus Christ, they're going to be damned in hell for all eternity, okay? And even if they do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and remain in their wicked ways, well, the Lord's going to chastise them, okay? Judgment's going to fall. They're not going to have a happy, uh, you know, satisfied, complete Christian life if as a believer they continue down the same forms of wickedness. Yeah. And so please understand, and I say this to my children and those that are younger, because the thoughts that cross your mind, man, why be in church on Sunday? I can hang out with my mates, right? Those same thoughts, guess what? Your parents thought the same things when they were teenagers. And guess what? Your grandparents thought of the same things when they were teenagers. It's nothing new, okay? Because teenagers always think, oh man, my parents, they're so old fashioned or whatever. You know, I need to step out of their shadow. Listen, we've all had the same thoughts. And we've all been that stupid, foolish animal, like the psalmist says. Okay? We've all come thinking those, those stupid thoughts as uh, you know, young people or you know, when you envy the wicked. But let's go back to uh, Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse number 3. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse number 3. Jeremiah says, But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried mine heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. So Jeremiah wakes up to himself. He realizes, oh yeah, like the psalmist. Well, Lord, the day of your judgment is coming. All right? I I'm trying to live godly for you. Lord, check my heart. Make sure it's right towards you. And Lord, th th these that you're going to judge, these people in the land of Judah, you know, Lord, they're going to be like a sheep to the slaughter. You know, and God's, look, he's saying, look, Lord, prepare them for the day of slaughter. All right? He, he realizes, okay, God, no, your judgment's right. It's, it's got to come. We, we, we've got to face this as a nation. It's time for this nation to be slaughtered. It's time for this nation to face your judgment. So he, he wakes up to himself. Instead of saying, wow, look at the, the wicked. Now he's realizing, no, your judgment is coming, right? He's, he's woken up to that truth, okay? Now, I also want you to notice there that, you know, uh, God will always bring judgment to the wicked. And Jeremiah is not trying to uh, take vengeance for himself, Okay? He's not the one trying to, uh, you know, all he's doing, he's warning the people. He's just preaching God's word. That's all he's doing. But he realizes that it's the Lord. What did it say there? It says, um, pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. You know, Jeremiah is saying, Lord, if that's your business, you know, judgment, vengeance, that, that comes on you, Lord. I'm not going to take action in my own hands. Lord, when the time is right, you're going to bring judgment upon the wicked. And we have to remember this in, in, in the wicked days that we live. That when we see uh, the wickedness in our governments and our, our, our politicians and, and, and the powers that be, you know, remember, don't take vengeance in your own hands. You can pray like Jeremiah. Lord, prepare them for the day of slaughter. Lord, prepare them, you know, get them ready for your judgment to fall upon them. There's nothing wrong with praying for that. Okay, you'd be in the same view or thinking the same things as Jeremiah. You know, some people struggle with these kinds of prayers when you're praying for the Lord to judge the wicked. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're asking the Lord to step in. He's the righteous judge. He'll do it at the right time. And anytime the Lord judges, anytime the Lord slaughters, it's right. 
It's correct. Okay? It's always the correct action by the Lord, even though it may seem a little harsh on us. Okay? But that's because we are envious of the wicked. That's because we, we, that flesh in us that, that thinks some of those things are okay. But when we wake up to the reality of God's word, we come to his sanctuary, we understand, no, Lord, you must be so frustrated at this wicked world. Lord, thank you for being merciful so far, because this is why so many of us are saved today, because you've given us an opportunity. And Lord, thank you for the time you've given us, but we also know the time comes for your judgment to fall on the wicked. So there's nothing wrong to pray to the Lord when you become frustrated at this world. Instead of you being full of frustration and being upset, just say, Lord, deal with it, Lord, please. You know, take the wicked, slaughter them, judge them in your time, Lord. In your time. All right? Verse number four. How long shall the land mourn, and the herbs of every field wither? For the wickedness of them that dwell therein, the beasts are consumed, and the birds, because they said, he shall not see our last end. So I've preached on this before, but you know, the sin of the nation was affecting creation, was affecting the land, the, the animals. Anyway, verse number five. If thou hast run with the footmen... And they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? So now the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah, okay? And he's asking Jeremiah, you know, well, oh, oh, let's keep going. It says, and if, and if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swirling of Jordan? Okay, uh, this is a great verse because it's basically saying, look, if you want to contend with horses, now I don't know, have you ever raced with a horse? You know, in Australia, we love the Melbourne Cup. Well, I mean, I don't care about it. But, you know, Australians love the Melbourne Cup and seeing those horses run. And uh, is, it, is it like a million, million dollars to win, that pri to, to win that race? Something along those lines? Or maybe more? I don't know. You know, it's quite a lot. But hey, those, those horses run hard. Okay, God has created those horses to be powerful creatures, powerful creatures of war. And, you know, in a, in a short-term sprint, a horse will always beat a man in a short term. In a long term, a man can beat a horse. Okay, because men are created differently. But in a short term, uh, a horse can uh, definitely outrun a man. Now, if you want to contend with horses, if you want to be a, like a spiritual, you know, warrior, you know, uh, someone that, that can, uh, you know, go all the way and, and contend with some powerful creatures, you first have to learn how to run with the footmen. The footmen there is the infantry. You know, it's, it's the, the armies. So obviously in this day and age, you know, uh, to get your soldiers around, they would have to, uh, you know, run, get from one place to the, to the next place. It's not like they had all the vehicles that our armies have today. They would have to, but here's, what it's saying here is, in order for you to run hard, in order for you to serve God faithfully, in order for you to be strong in the faith, you must start with what might be, uh, what, it, what is lesser, right? Running with the infantry, walking with the infantry. If you can't keep up with the infantry, there's no way you're going to run with, or keep up with horses, or contend with horses. You say, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. If you want to achieve something great with God, okay, just start with the little that God has given you. Okay? You want to do big things for God. I want to do big things for God. You know, I do. I, I want Blessed Hope Baptist Church to do great things for God. You know, I, I want us to, to be on our deathbed and say, man, you know what? We did some amazing things for God, you know, in our church. You know, I'm, I'm ready to meet my Savior. You know, I want New Life Baptist Church to, to do great things with God. And we can have these grandiose plans. And nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with thinking big. Okay? But in order for you to achieve the big things, you must take care of what is smaller first. Okay? If you've got a big plan, you know what? In 2021, maybe in 2020, you haven't read your Bible cover to cover. You make a plan. You know what, Lord? I'm going to read my Bible cover to cover in 2021. Hey, that's a good plan. Hey, that, that's really good because many Christians haven't even read their Bible once cover to cover. Okay? <laughs> but here's the thing. You've got to start, well, that's a big plan. How am I going to get there? You know what? All it is is 15 minutes a day. You know what? Lord, can I do 15 minutes a day? Can I, can I, can I find 15 minutes, Lord? Maybe seven minutes in the morning. Maybe eight minutes in the evening if you can't do it all at once. <clears throat> Are you willing to give it that? Because here's the thing. If you're not willing to do that, you're not going to get for the Bible at the end of the year. Okay? So you've got to just break it down small. I want to achieve something big but I've got to do what, what is small. If you can't commit a few minutes every day to the Word of God, you're not going to read your Bible cover to cover. Okay? And so it, it's wonderful to think about the big plan, but always, well, I need to first start with the smaller things. And that's how I get to the big picture. All right? What else? 
You know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 5, speaking about the qualifications of the pastor or the bishop, it says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, you know, taking care of a church of God is kind of like contending with the horses. It requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of sacrifice. But if you can't even rule your own house, if you can't even uh, have your children in subjection and for them to be faithful, obedient children and for your wife to be submissive to the husband and you can't provide for your own family, you know, you don't even work hard and, and give them what they need, how are you going to look after a church? Okay? And so, you know, God gives us uh, opportunities that we can then use uh, to, to further ourselves to do bigger things. You know, if you want to be a pastor one day, you've got to just learn how to run a family. And yet, how many pastors today have been ordained where they don't, that maybe they're not even married? Or they didn't even have children. Okay? And then they're eventually going to mess up the church because they haven't even uh, run with the infantry. They haven't run with the footmen. And they're trying to contend the horses. They're going to fail. They can't keep up. You know, we need to think about what God has given us. Even if it's something small, take care of that. And if you take care of that, you'll be able to do something greater for the Lord. You know, when he came to King David, or, or before he became King David, and he took on Goliath. Was that his first battle, do you think? No. You know, he goes to, to King Saul and he says, Look, I, I, I've slain the, the lion, I've slain the bear, and if God has given me victory, then God's going to give me victory over Goliath. But David learned a lesson. I've got to first take down these, these animals, then I can take on the Philistines' most powerful warrior. Okay? Hey, yeah, David could contend with the horses because he learned how to run with the footmen. Okay? And so that's the lesson that we have here. But not only that, if you look at the second part of verse number 5, it says, And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? So we know Jordan is the, the Jordan River there, right? So it's talking about the swelling of Jordan. What's that talking about? That's like a, like a flood, right? Maybe too much rain has fallen on the land, and then the, the banks you know, can't contain the water, and so there's a flooding, right? And normally when there's a flooding, it causes some type of natural disaster, Right? But the Lord's saying here, look, when, th when you're at peace and you can't serve me when things are peaceful, you know, before COVID, let's say, okay, before we had some, some challenges, if you couldn't even come to church when it's a time of peace and it's easy to come to church, how are you going to come to church when things get difficult? Right? I mean, how are you going to serve God when the time gets more difficult? You know, people will often say, man, you know what? I will serve God no matter what, you know? I mean, think of the Apostle Peter. He says, Lord, I will never. I will, I will, you know, I, I will, uh, what's it say? Sorry, I'm forgetting the, forget the I, will, I will never deny you, Lord, right? Peter says. But when things get difficult for him, what happened? He denied the Lord three times, right? You, you, you know, what you, you've got to learn when there's a time of peace, that's the time for you to get yourself worked up spiritually, to read your Bible, to learn how to pray, to study your, your word, to, to be in the habit of being in church, you know, to, to, to be in the habit of, of preaching the gospel to the lost. Because if you're not doing it during peaceful times, hey, when the Jordan River overflows, when there's flooding, there's turmoil, and there's hardship, you're, not, you're definitely not going to be doing it then. Okay? And so you need to learn how to use the time that God has given us when times have been peaceful to just serve God then. And when times get difficult, you're going to continue serving God even then. Amen. Okay? Look at verse number 6. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse number 6. For even thy brethren and the house of thy father. So this is God telling Jeremiah about his own family. The house of your father, your brethren, that's your brothers and sisters. They have... Uh, even they have dealt treacherously with thee. Yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto thee. So Jeremiah's own household did not like what Jeremiah was preaching. Okay? They've dealt treacherously with thee. They're, they're doing harm to you, Jeremiah. Okay? He says, believe them not, though they speak fair words unto thee. What is he saying? He says, the people in your own household, your own family, hey, they speak nicely to you, okay? But God's son Jeremiah, don't believe them. They don't love you. They don't care for you, okay? They're trying to hurt you, Jeremiah. God's warning them about this. And you know what? This just reminds me, as soon as I, I, I think about this passage, I think about flattery. 
And in Proverbs 29 verse 5, it says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Okay? Now, you might be the target of flattery one day. You say, what is flattery? When someone speaks well of you, well, that's part of it, but it's overboard. And you know it's overboard. And you know, you know it's, it's when people come up to me, and they don't just say, hey, pastor, that was a good sermon. But when they come up to me and say, you know what, pastor, you're like the best preacher in the world. Right? You know, every sermon you preach, man, it's like, oh, man, you know, this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And they flatter you. And you know what? It can feel good sometimes. All right? Because it, 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 it feeds the ego. It feeds the flesh. Okay? And then you've got to be reminded, hold on, is this flattery? Is this flattery? You know? And I'm just telling you, the amount of times that I've seen the, the people that have been the most critical of our church and of myself as a pastor have always been those that have had the most flattery. You know, just, 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 oh man, it's so amazing. Look how God's using you. You know, it's like, man, yeah, of course, but you just seem to be going a little bit too far. And, and you know, you want to give people the benefit of the doubt. And you say, well, maybe he's just excited. Maybe he's just really happy. And, you know, he's just thankful to be in a good church or whatever. But those, yeah, you eventually find out, no, they're not there for the long run. In fact, they may have even be trying to put a net, some type of trap before you to cause you to stumble, to cause you to fall. You need to be aware of flattery. God is warning Jeremiah, be, be careful. They speak to you, right, in fair words, beautiful words. Jeremiah is such a great preacher, but really they're trying to uh, uh, deal treacherously with Jeremiah. And so God says, look, don't believe them. Don't believe their words. We need to be aware when someone's been too uh, uh, flatter, uh, you know, using flattery with their lips to praise you, you need to be careful, you know, and just ask the question, is this person being genuine? Or are they trying to cause me to stumble, to cause me to fall? Verse number seven. I have forsaken mine house. I have left mine heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. So when the Lord says here, I've forsaken mine house, we know what the house of the Lord was. In the Old Testament, it was his temple. Okay? And of course, Jeremiah is preaching to the southern kingdom, which has Jerusalem, which has a temple. God says, look, I've already left. I'm gone. My presence is no longer there where they're coming to sacrifice uh, to me and worship me. He says, I've left my heritage. Look at this. I have given my, the dearly beloved, that's the, that's the people of Judah, the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. You know, God, in other words, God was protecting Judah all this time from the enemy. In fact, the northern kingdom about 120 years before this was taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And you know, the Assyrians, they wanted to, to go into the southern kingdom and capture it as, as well. They were planning to do it. But God stepped in and did a miracle and, and killed, you know, thousands of their troops. You know, where the, where the king of Assyria, you know, uh, realizes, look, look at all these dead bodies overnight. And he realized, man, God's not helping me here. And he and ends up fleeing. But God was protecting Judah from all these enemies that wanted to hurt it. And now God says, you know what? I'm going to give my beloved to its enemies. I'm going to allow judgment to fall. Now, please keep your finger there. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 4. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 4. Because if God can forsake his house, and we know in the New Testament, his house is the local church, then let's not become too prideful to believe that God can never forsake this house. He can. He can. Okay? He can forsake blessed hope Baptist Church. But in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4, Jesus is speaking to, to churches here. And he says in Revelation 2, 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Jesus is warning the church here that he can remove the candlestick. Hey, we ought to be that light. You know, the church is meant to be the light of the world. We are all meant to here uh, represent Christ and, and be a, a, the bearer of the good news of the gospel and, and to serve God and to be different from this world. Jesus says, look, there can come a time when I take that candlestick and I remove it. When my presence is removed from the local church. 
Why is it removed? Because they left their first love. You know what? If, if we lose our love for God, you know, what's the first commandment? To love the Lord with all our hearts, minds, soul, right? And strength. You know, if we, if we uh, just get in the habit of just, just it's just a, just, just a you know, mundane task that we do every week to be in the house of God and we forget to worship God, we forget to love Him, the Lord's warning us that the next step there is that we're going to not do the first works. And my best understanding of the first works is the Great Commission. You know, what Jesus Christ left us here to, to preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize, to teach all things whatsoever I have commanded thee. You know what? And if, if we're not teaching God's word, we're not preaching the gospel, we're not doing the baptisms, God's going to remove his candlestick from his house. He's going to remove his presence from his house. And you know, let it never be so, you know, for Blessed Up Baptist Church. You know, as long as I'm the pastor here, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure we remain to be a candlestick here. Okay? And if one day you guys have a new pastor, you need to remind that man, listen, we need to remain as a candlestick. We need to keep serving God. We need to keep loving God. We need to keep doing the first works that Christ has left us to do. And when we see that starting to slip, we need to, we need to fix that. Okay, we need to fix that. Sometimes the, the pastor needs a gentle reminder. <laughs> you know, we need to get back on track. Otherwise, we might risk losing the presence of God. Okay? So these warnings are here from, for us in the Old Testament. Okay? Not to just, oh man, look how wicked they were, but to warn us. Lord, help us not to become like them. Okay? Back to Jeremiah chapter 12, verse number 8. Now, what I'm about to read will blow the minds of a dispensationalist. Okay? Because a dispensationalist believes that God has this, you know, this great love for Israel, no matter what. You know, they're the apple of God's eye, no matter what. You know, if you're aware of dispensationalism, I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here, okay? But look what he says in verse number 8. He says, mine heritage. What was the heritage? Remember in verse number 7, he called it his dearly beloved? But look what he says about them in verse number 8. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. So God says, look, it used to be my beloved. I used to love this nation. Now, I hate it. I hate it. Brethren, you know what? Israel today in the Middle East, God hates that nation. They've turned against God. They still don't believe in Jesus Christ. They think he's a false prophet. Okay, some false messiah. You think they're right with God? You think God's looking down at that nation? Man, I just love those people. No, God's, God's hate, God hates them. Okay? And look, can they be beloved? They can be. Okay? If they believe God, if they believe the gospel, if they get right with God. You know what that tells me about our church? If you're saved, you believe in Jesus Christ, we are his beloved. We are his beloved, brethren. Okay? But you can see here that God can turn from love to hatred. You know? And I, I was going to say very quickly, it seems very quickly because it's like, Verse number 7, verse number 8. But don't forget, these things are going on for decades. These are going on for years and years and years, how they've been slowly turning themselves against the Lord, worshipping false gods. Okay? Verse number 9. Mine heritage, again, the people of Judah, is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. So God is illustrated, using an illustration here of Judah as a speckled, I don't know what a speckled bird really is, but anyway, let's think about it of a, of a bird, maybe it's nesting, right? And you know how other birds, other predatory birds sometimes will go into the nests of other birds and take their eggs, okay? And so that's the kind of the idea. You've got all these other birds round about are against her, right? But not only the birds, it says, come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. So you've got this little bird. And all these predatory birds wanting to, to eat that bird. But not just the bird, all the, all the predatory animals. You know, are, are trying, uh, and basically, you know, God's using that as an illustration of Babylon. You know, of all the surrounding uh, nations, especially, that are enemies. Because you'll see later on, the enemies of, of Judah. They're, they all want to destroy that nation. And God's saying, alright, come, it's time to destroy them. Come, it's time to devour that speckled bird, which is the southern kingdom. Verse number 10. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. 
They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. So again, a warning to pastors. Again, the pastor here was a, a leader of the people okay, um, in the Old Testament, but we can apply this to the New Testament. These pastors have destroyed the vineyard. Why? Because they have trodden my portion under foot. Okay? So, you know, it's not a pastor's job. It's not my job to trample all over you. Okay? And again, some pastors are like this. It's, there's nothing new. Okay? Some pastors will make you feel like you know, they'll, they'll use, um, you know, uh, you know psych psychological, psychological weapons against you, right? Where, where you're sort of like, you know, does my pastor like me or does he not? You know what? You know, and sometimes, you know, the pastor will make you feel like, you know, he's angry at you. So you're trying to, oh man, I've got to make it up to the pastor. What do I have to do? Do I have to put more money in the, you know, in, in the offering? Do I have to, you know, bring him a meal? Do I have to do all these special favors so, you know, he can be on my side? You know, or a pastor might just have, a, you know, favorites. You know, how do I get into the group of favorites? What do I have to do? Right? And, and, you, and then, like, you know, a pastor might be, you know, get angry at you. You know, he might demand things from you. You know, he's, he's, you know some people like this want to tread you under their foot. I don't want to do that, brethren. I promise you that. I don't want to do that. If, I, I don't want to tread you under my, under my foot. I just want to edify you. I want to lift you up. I want you to grow in Bible knowledge. I want you to grow in love for God, right? And if you miss a church service, I don't want to be the kind of pastor that rings you up. Hey, where were you this Sunday? Are there pastors like that? Absolutely. You know what? If you're not here this Sunday, you're not here for the service, or well, we kind of know why because of COVID. But you know, other reasons, look, there must be other things going on. There must be something important for them not to be in church today. All right? And, I'm, and, I, and I rest easy at that, right? I'm not going to ring you up like other pastors do, Maybe after, if you miss out church for a while, I'll ring you up more out of concern. Are you okay, brother? I haven't seen you for a few weeks. Is there anything that you need? Can I pray for you? Okay? But not to ring you up, man, well, you haven't been in church for the last few weeks. What's going on? You know? And some pastors can be like that, right? They tread underfoot uh, God's people. And it reminds me there of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 2. I'll just read it to you. It says, feed the flock of God which is among you. That's the job of the pastor, to feed the flock of God, taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraints, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money that is, but of a ready mind. Then it says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. Brethren, if I ever overstep my, you know, my position with you, if, if I all of a sudden try to become a lord in your, in your life, you know, t you know get, get into your family life, you know, get, get outside you know, the times of service and tell you what to do and boss you around, right? And, 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 you know, it's right for you to rebuke me, okay? Because it's not my responsibility to be a lord over God's heritage. It's not my responsibility to tread underfoot, you know, God's heritage, okay? My job is to be an overseer, okay? To watch out for our souls, to edify you, to lift you up, to give you knowledge, to feed you God's word. Many people have come out of churches where they felt like, man, they must feel like, you know, the pastor is this God-man. You know, everything he says, everything he does is right. You know, whatever he criticizes, that must be right. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in criticizing you. I'm not interested in finding, look, can, can I, if I wanted to, could I literally make a list of all the things that I think is wrong in every family in this church? I could do that. In fact, you could probably make a list of things that are wrong in my family. <laughs> right? We could do that. But that's not my job, Reverend. My job is just to feed you God's word. You know, and it's then your responsibility to say, okay, I've learned God's word. How am I going to apply this in my life? It's not for me to go into your family and tell you how to manage things. Okay, and, and be a Lord in your life. That's not my job. Okay, it's the Lord's job to be the Lord. Okay, he's in charge. Right. But you can see how bad pastors can really ruin churches, ruin Christian lives. Back to Jeremiah. Oh, you're already there. Verse number 12. It says, the spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness. For the sword of the Lord shall devour from the one end of the land, even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. So when it says that the sword of the Lord shall devour, again, this is about the Babylonians. The Babyl the, the, you know, this, this kingdom from the north are, are coming down to destroy Judah. But here it's referred to as the sword of the Lord. Don't forget, it's God's judgment that's fallen upon them. Verse number 13, they have sown wheat, 
but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit. And they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. So now we're looking at part of the, this, this judgment that's fallen upon Judah. God's saying, look, you're going to go out there, you're going to sow wheat. You know, you're going to start to try to grow you know, crops in your land. But instead of wheat, you're going to receive thorns. Okay? And don't forget, this is part of the curse of man. You know, when, when God cursed Adam, I'll just read it to you in, in Genesis 3.18. God told Adam, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. And so God is saying, look, part of the curse, part of the judgment because you've sinned against me, is working is not going to be that easy. There's going to be the thorns. There's going to be the thistles. There's going to be challenges in order for you to provide for yourself. Well, God's kind of taking that same principle and applying it even further here in the land of Judah. You're going to go about trying to grow your crops, grow your wheat, but God's going to cause it for thorns to come up you know, and, and uh, destroy those crops. So part of the judgment was also on the farmland. Verse number 14. Now, verse number 14 is quite interesting. It says, Thus saith the Lord against all mine evil neighbors. So God now is not speaking to Judah, but he's speaking to all of the evil neighbors of, of Israel. So all the other nations, say Egypt, right, uh, the Philistines. Think about all the different people that we often see. You know, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. Think about all the kinds of enemies that we see Israel in battle with. All, all its surrounding neighbors that are constantly at war with Israel. So God's speaking to them now, okay? And God, God, look, God refers to them as evil neighbors. But look, he's speaking to them. He says, That touch the inheritance which I caused my people Israel to inherit. Behold. What does behold mean? It means pay attention, right? Look out. God's telling them, listen, pay attention to what's going to happen. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. So God is now, Jeremiah is now preaching to the other nations. Pay attention. Watch now that God's going to take his people, that nation of Judah is going to pluck them out of the land. Pay attention, evil neighbors. Okay? So, of course, we know that's when the Babylonians came and took the people into captivity, being plucked out of the land. Why is God telling these evil Gentile neighbors to pay attention? Let's keep going. Verse 15. And it shall come to pass, after that I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them, so we know that happened 70 years you know, later in captivity. And will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. So God is again, he prophesying for Jeremiah. Yes, they're going to be plucked out of the land, but there's going to come the time, which is seven years later, they're going to come back into the land. But he's telling the nations around them, pay attention. Listen, watch what's happening, right? Verse number 16. This is why it's so important. It says, and it shall come to pass, if they will diligently... Learn the ways of my people. So God's, God's telling these wicked Gentile nations, look, if you learn the ways of my people, if you learn the ways of those that were in Judah, and swear by my name, the Lord liveth, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. But if they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation saith the Lord. So what is God saying? He says, look, when they come back in, you know, in the seven years captivity, okay, I've given you this prophecy, so you know it's coming from the Lord. You'll see that they're soon going to be plucked away and they're going to come back eventually. But if these wicked, evil neighbors say, you know what? We want to serve God. Okay? We want to follow after the ways of, of God's people. We want to swear by the name of the Lord. We want to say the Lord liveth. We want to make God our God. God says to these Gentile nations, okay, right at the end of verse number 16, then shall they be built in the midst of my people. Listen, God was never racist. God was not like, man, I just love Israel. I just love the Jews. And I hate every other nation around them. No, God's saying to them, listen, pay attention because your, your opportunity is coming up here. When they come back into the land, if you guys come and worship me as well, you can be in the midst of my people. I'm going to build you up in the midst of my people. God was always open to Gentile nations. If they turn from their wickedness, they turn from their false religion, and they turn to the one true God of Israel, God would receive them. 
Okay? So, it's, you know, yes, Israel was special in the eyes of God, but only if they were godly, only if they worshipped God, only if they loved God, right? But God, at the same time, was willing for other people of other nations to worship the same true God as long as they learnt the same ways. They did the same things. They believed in the Lord like the people of Israel. You know, nothing's changed. God has always had an opportunity for other nations, yes, the evil neighbours, to come and believe on Him. Okay? Now, if you can please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's end on this one. Ephesians chapter 2. And while you turn to Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read to you from Numbers 9.14. Okay? Numbers 9.14. And in Numbers 9.14, God tells the nation of Israel, He says, And if a stranger shall sojourn among you, now a stranger is someone that's not of Israel. That would be from the other nations, Right? And will keep the Passover unto the Lord according to the ordinance of the Passover. And we know the Passover represents Jesus Christ. And this is, and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance, both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. God is saying, look, if a stranger comes from another nation and they want to worship God, they want to keep the Passover, they want to remember Christ through that picture, he says, look, allow them to come. God was always open to the other nations. Okay? Now this takes us to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 13. So now, you can see that in the Old Testament, God had a plan for the Gentiles. They could believe in the Lord. They could be saved as well. Okay? But then in Ephesians chapter 2 in the New Testament, we also have this in verse number 13. It says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Enmity is like another way of saying enemy. It's kind of like the neighbors of, Israel, of Judah were the enemies, right? Well, God's broken that down. Okay? Even the law of commandments contain ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so make in peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. So we have this beautiful picture here of Christ's sacrifice, that through his death, through his blood, that he's brought this peace between those of Israel and the Gentile nations. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are one people. We are one body. We are one spiritual body. But notice, while that's new in a sense from a spiritual nation perspective, the same was also true in a physical nation. Right? And so it's not like God just changed his mind. Okay? These things were pictures of Jesus Christ. People were allowed to, to uh, worship in Israel, worship the one true God, you know, even if they were from these Gentile uh, evil neighbors that are referred to here. And so God always had a plan for the entire world, okay? Don't get into this dispensational thinking that only in the Old Testament, God only loved the Jews. In fact, He still loves the Jews, even though they reject Him, and we're like plan B. We just got in because God rejected the Jews. That is so far from the truth. God has always had a plan for the Gentiles, all right? And just like the Israelites, they were meant to be a light to the world. They were meant to be a holy nation. They were meant to be the ones that proclaimed the goodness of God and salvation through the Lord God, okay? But they failed. Well, let us not be like them. You know, God has given us, this church, the responsibility to be the light in the world, to go and preach the gospel, to proclaim uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, so we could bring others and, and bring them to peace with us, with the Lord God, okay? So we're given the same responsibilities as the Jews of old, all right? Let's not fail in the task. They failed. They failed. Okay, but let's make sure that we don't fail. We don't fail in our love for God. We don't fail in the first works because we want to make sure that God's presence is always here. We never want the Lord to say that he has forsaken, you know, blessed hope Baptist church. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord.